This is episode 361. Okay. And we are back with episode, with part two of episode 361 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch old movie series with 1931's Machen in Uniform. And joining us to talk about the film is Jenny Olson. Jenny, thank you so much for, for joining the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Before we, uh, we dig into the movie, I know um, for those who are familiar with the film, uh, you've probably seen Ginny. She did the, uh, the audio commentary for the, the Kino Lorber um, copy, which is on the Criterion channel. But um, just, I wanted to give you an opportunity to give a little bit of your background and just kind of what you do. Um, yeah, great. Um, well, I do a lot of things. Um, I'm a filmmaker actually, uh, but I, I'm here with my LGBT film historian and archivist hat on today. Um, and uh, which I've been doing for 30 plus years. I love the idea that this is young critics. Was that what you said? <laughs> like, yes, that's me. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, yeah, I'm a film critic, a film historian, film archivist. Um, and um, yeah, I was really so thrilled to get to do the, um, the audio commentary for the Kino Lorber restored Blu-ray, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, is on Criterion Channel and other places and, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, on, on that kind of on that note, that's kind of a good place to jump off on because you, you, you kind of opened the commentary with this. So you've had kind of a little, you know, a, a long history with this film as, as, as being one that um, not only just historical significance, but also it was one of the first films that you actually curated. I'm kind of curious, you know, you mentioned that this, you had not seen the movie before you, um, you, you had like curated it. I mean, so what, what was, when you saw it for the first time, did it kind of hold up? Cause I know it just has this like kind of, it has this background as being this very important you know, queer movie. And so I was wondering for you, like, did it hold up that first time? And what was your first impression? Yeah, I curated it in 1987. Um, I, I uh, was at the University of Minnesota um, and I uh, was getting my BA and started a gay film series on campus. And it was the mm -hmm. very first film that I programmed. And yeah. um, this was of course, well, I guess, VHS existed at the time, but mm -hmm. um, it was not out on VHS yet. And, yeah, where did and, you uh, even access it? What's that? Where did you even access it? Well, it so in back in the day, it was because you uh, couldn't pirate stuff. You couldn't like find a crappy rip on YouTube then. Like, how did you find <laughs> these classic stuff? Yeah, YouTube was far far <laughs> from even being a concept. Yeah. Um, well. Uh, no, it was, I mean, there, uh, it was a 16 millimeter print through the, the like educational film distribution um, uh, company. Um, and, uh, but the thing about it was, I mean, you could, you know, pre-screen things if you like, were like, oh, send me the 16 millimeter print to look <laughs> at and then I'll program it. But uh, I had read about the film um, in Vito Russo's book, The Cellulite Closet the history of homosexuality mm -hmm. on film. And um, and I knew that, you know, well, I knew I wanted to see it and I, I figured that other people would wanna see it as well, which was kind of the origins of this gay film series. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was amazing to see, although, you know, interestingly at the time, the, uh, the prints were terrible, the condition, mm -hmm. the, um, and, which is one of the reasons that this new restoration is so amazing to see mm -hmm. because also there's a complicated censorship history um when it came out in the u.s in the 30s there uh, and Vito writes about this in his book that it was there were a lot of cuts that were made um by the hayes office and mm -hmm. uh and so the prints that had been in circulation you know were also cut and, and not only that, like you had these like, clearly it was sort of patched together from like different prints. And mm -hmm. anyway, it looked terrible, but uh, you know, but of course it was exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, when you, when you showed it, cause 
uh, it, you mentioned the censorship. We can kind of get into that a little bit later, but you have like the, the as you mentioned, the, the US cut, but then you also have the German cut. Um, I can't remember, did, they, did the, the Nazis, did they cut it down again from what it originally was? You know, it, it, there are like layers and layers and layers. I mean, it, it originally came out, you know, in 1931 mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it was, you know, as the Nazis rose to power that it, it was, I mean, it was completely pulled out of distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I think it's just so crazy that it wasn't lost. Um, just yeah. thinking about when it came out and where it came out that it, that way didn't get completely destroyed and has survived all this time. Um, it's true. There's actually, I just have to say, I have to give you a quote since you referenced Definitely. that. <laughs> so one of the last things that I say in the audio commentary is a, a quote from um, B. Ruby Rich, mm -hmm. who Ruby's scholarship on this film was so significant in the 80s um, and really uh, kind of elevated, re-elevated it, it as a significant film and she wrote this great thing where she said um like reflecting back particularly on the vibrant lesbian culture that this arose out of in mm -hmm. Weimar Berlin um and she said uh Mädchen emerges not as an anomaly but as a survivor mm -hmm. you know and that it is incredible to watch it and and realize that there was this thriving culture and that it wasn't you know, it wasn't an anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, but yeah, we're so fortunate to have it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's, that was something that really struck me, um, just kind of listening to your commentary and then just reading about it, that mm -hmm. um, the thing that really attracted me to the movie for the series is that I think, um, like, we just did a, a, a queer movie series for Pride Month. And, I'll, you know, I think probably, and Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the oldest movie was, I think, maybe like 96, 94, maybe. Was that The Birdcage? Yeah, some, you know, so it's, and there's, and it go, you can go much, you know, farther. You, you I've seen the, the documentary version of The Celluloid Closet, and there, you have that far-reaching history. But mm -hmm. I think, especially with, with really this interest in, in LGBT films now, um, there's almost this... Uh, you know, people maybe forget or don't think that you can go into the silent era and that there would be movies that have pretty explicitly, you know, have explicit lesbian content, like, like a movie like this. And it's because there was that vibrant community in Berlin. And so it was interesting to hear you kind of mm. talk about how that was a, a, a reason why this type of story could be told. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, well, I talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the other films of the time that had lesbian characters, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Diary of a Lost Girl and mm -hmm. uh, which I'm gonna call it Pandora's Box. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, like Sternberg's Morocco. Um, and then earlier stuff, the, I mean, what's considered to be the first gay film is, or gay feature film is mm -hmm. uh, different from the others from 1919. Um, and then, and, it's interesting that all these films are German. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Have you ever like probed that? Like, because I, I I thought that was interesting. Also, you raised that question. Is it like, is it just culturally they were more open to that, or you know, what like, I guess what would be the reasoning? Right. I mean, I mean, I guess I I often say I'm not a historian. I'm a film historian. <laughs> sure. And, and I'm like, I don't know, I mean, uh, you know, but I do, but I do whatever, you know, a bit about, you know, in terms of LGBT history mm -hmm. in general that, um, and I talk about this a little bit in the commentary that, um, as we were alluding to, you know, that queer culture at the time was so vibrant in that, in that era. Um, but, and that uh, Magnus Hirschfeld in particular was uh, a really important figure um, in, in that, uh, you know, creating of culture and community. And mm -hmm. um, um, anyway, in, in specifically in Berlin at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was there, um... You know, you, you mentioned a number of different kind of other titles that, that were also um, 
that were also de- you know dealing with this with similar subject matter. I mean, was the, were there filmmakers who were because of that that community there actively making you know LGBT movies, or was it just you know you had stories kind of like Matchin where it just kind of came out as just kind of an anomaly, not or I, you know was I guess yeah. was, it, was it kind of active? I can't think of other examples per se in terms of what mm-hmm. you're what you're exactly asking and um but um and you know obviously or maybe not obviously but like you know the community uh and like how Mm -hmm. folks thought of themselves and what that all looked like you know was not a you know whatever mirror of our contemporary ideas of what it means to be lgbt an individual or part of the culture or you know um uh, but, um, but I mean, I, I, I think I do have a little bit more of a sense of the theater scene yeah. in Berlin and, um, and one of the things that I talk about a lot and that is like one of my favorite things about Machen is, um, seeing Erica Mann, mm-hmm. um, who was very active in the theater, who was an out lesbian, who mm-hmm. was, uh, Thomas Mann's daughter um and um just so amazing and and it's so amazing to see her and it's just exciting every time she's on screen she plays one of the one of the teachers and um and you know was just this really amazing cultural figure Mm -hmm. as an you know as an out lesbian yeah did you mention in the film i can't remember if it was her or another actress um where you had said something about just halfway through the film she just disappeared and they put somebody else in was it Eric Kaman? yes correct mm. she was uh sacked um i and i we don't we don't know why but okay. uh uh i don't know maybe she was too sassy with <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but she uh she was sacked and so in the last scene i guess they must have shot it sequentially mm-hmm. so the last scene that that character is in um you know as the camera comes and pans mm-hmm. across all the teachers it's like it's a totally different actress who's yeah. playing that character it's- it would be so easy to not notice that necessarily because i feel like they don't focus too much on many of the individual teachers other than yeah. um yeah. The, the main yeah. um, teacher so yeah, I, I figure kind of digging into the the movie a little bit. Uh, one way I kind of wanted to 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 kind of jump in is um, it was interesting to to hear you talk about like the you know going back to the whole reception of the movie, um, and you were talking about the the actress who played Manuela, how she was you know receiving love letters and uh, people really responded to like the kiss scene, um, you know in terms of like the, the reception of how people kind of read the movie, um, you know, what, what, what was that kind of, what was that kind of initial response with, with, with just, I guess the movie in general, but clearly this, this main actress is kind of that central, that central figure of the film. Um, right. Um, so the lead actresses, um, I spent so much time trying to learn how to pronounce their names correctly. And I'm always like, I think probably I'm still not doing it right, but um, Herta Tile and mm-hmm. Dorotea Vick. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Dorotea was the teacher and Herta Tile was the student, Manuela. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so uh, let me just back up for a second. So yeah. in, the, in the 80s, um, Carola Graman and um, I can't remember her partner's name, did an interview with Herta Tile, mm-hmm. um, you know, who was at that point, whatever, fairly older. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and they asked her a bunch of questions about, you know, the reception of the film and what it was like. And, and, and I did, so I, I leaned on that a lot for the research for the, for the um, audio commentary. And so in that interview, um, Herta Tile talks about having gotten, you know, all these letters from fans and um, what this incredible response to the film at the time. Um, and now I forgot your actual question. 
Um, no, that's that that's that's kind of what it, you know. That, that's kind of what it was that they. Um, it seemed like they really responded to to her performance, and um, you know, it's interesting the way that the Leighton Sagan, the director, how she uh, how that's kind of shot because. Um, I think I read somewhere they they referenced that it kind of is similar to kind of like um, how Dreyer has like in, in Passion of Joan of Arc like they have like the the kind of close up the very soft close up shots of her um, there is and there is kind of like this uh, uh, kind of na almost naive eroticism you know because she's since she's supposed to be you know a fourteen year old in the movie um, and I guess you know, was that kind of one of the reasons why just kind of that, the way that she shot, the way that she, she's presented, one of the reasons why they responded to it or were they kind of tapping into it, the, the kind of themes that the movie was also presenting? Well, again, you know, to just to return to talking about this, you know, amazing reality of the culture at the time that there really mm. was this, um, you know, lesbian community, um, uh, uh, you know that people were aware of it as a lesbian film mm -hmm. um and uh and um anyway uh so it wasn't what am i trying to say um i mean it's one of the most you want you one of the one of the reasons that I am so I you know that queer film in particular, but all mm -hmm. kinds of identity based film is so important. Um, you know, is that people experience themselves as an individual person, you know, whatever. Yeah. Individual queer person. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here I am, I mean, in my example, you know, growing up in Minnesota thinking like I'm alone, I'm, you know. Da, da, da. And then I see, oh, I see myself on screen. I'm not alone. Here's this cultural artifact that exists. And then here I am, you know, going to see a film and then engaging with other people and, and you know, yeah. engaging in dialogue and, and experiencing community through the film itself. And um, anyway, so I, and that is one of the most exciting things to me thinking about Machen in terms of its, you know, exhibition history of of how it would have, um, you know, kind of coalesced a sense of uh, community. And, yeah. and, and um, wait, this is funny. I'm gonna just like find a prop here. This nice. Is, um, this is for the, uh, the video. So for this is why you have to watch the video, guys. <laughs> Everyone who's listening is gonna wanna, um, go look at the video for a second. In, this is not about Machen, but this is a, a still from the premiere of um, Garbo's Queen Christina, mm -hmm. which was a few years later. And I don't know if you can see this, but like, like particularly this woman with yeah. the hat on here. Yeah. And her. Yeah. I, I mean, this is like, this is the Hollywood premiere of Garbo's Queen Christina. And I'm like, these are dykes. These are totally <laughs> dykes who were yeah. like, oh my God, Queen Christina, Gar Gar Greta Garbo, like totally kisses, you know, it's like this total coded lesbian. Yeah. And, and you have this sense of like, and, and, and also from the coverage at the time, I have a bunch of research on Queen Christina and the coverage at the time, but also Machen in some of the reviews. Um, it's like, I want to say it's the Bosley Crowther New oh, York God. review where he references, um, he, re he references, I mean, he doesn't say the lesbians, but mm -hmm. he's, he's, I want to say he says something like, like the well of loneliness. Like he makes like, <laughs> You know these coded references to the existence of a lesbian community and you have the sense of like wow you know there was word of mouth there was folks coming out and anyway well that's crazy that, the thing that strikes me about the movie is just how affirming most of the characters are about um 
you know, like queer romance and relationships, um, all of the students are, you know, like completely on board with her. I mean, she's she's the most like one of the most well liked. But just as soon as she even enters the school, everyone's talking not only about crushing on Miss Von Bernberg, but uh, other girls too. There's a scene where uh, Von Bernberg takes the letter from the girl um, where she's talking about somebody having a crush on her, um, and it's just. I feel like we don't even have that world now in, in a lot of ways where the majority of your peers, the majority of people you're around are so affirming and positive. I mean, I just, I guess I was thinking like if this movie was made today, I feel like some of the school girls would be, you know, like, okay, yeah, I'm okay with that. And, but the majority would not be. Um, so I, there's such a charming and, and um, I don't know, almost something like a magical feeling watching it and really um, feeling the energy so that those all the actors who play the school girls bring. Um, I, I love that about it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, and like, I love that it, you know, it works on two levels, like one, um, you know, I mean, or whatever. There, it, it's not like it's like, you know, full on, like lesbians mm -hmm. like at the same time you know and it, it is all of it is like very subtle or very mm -hmm. um subdued or right. um you know but but yeah but there is like a an energy and an, a positiveness and a and a warmth and um and and that is part of what like some of the critical response in the US, including that Bosley Crowther, there are like several reviews where they kind of say, they say, it's, a, it's a, such an interesting thing. They go, they go, uh, yeah, some people see lesbianism, they don't use the word lesbian, but like see themes like well of loneliness here and basically imply that like those people have their mind in the gutter. Yeah. Uh, and that, <laughs> you know and but then the funny thing is that part of why the critics are saying that and why like your average straight audience might look at it and not see that is because it was censored and so that right. stuff was actually cut out and so you could watch it and be like I don't know what these people are talking about it's just right. a schoolgirl thing and it's a schoolgirl crush and like and it's like oh yeah well because they cut out the scene where the teacher kisses her and you know that that's not there. And then the scene at the end, I mean the, or the kind of, uh, do we give spoiler alerts? Do we it, say? It's, it came out in 1931. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean the kind of, you know, ultimate scene where yeah. Manuela um, gets drunk at the, mm -hmm party mm -hmm. or the thing and and is like proclaims her love you know mm -hmm. and it, it and you have this sense of like oh wow she's like really for real yeah kind of crossing the line here into yeah. like full-on and and it and it is like the kind of really exciting moment too yeah. though where that actually then coincides with a the political radicalness of the mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. and that it is it is also this anti-fascist film and right. and that is like the alignment of you know lesbianism and um you know a kind of progressive message around you know these are young women who need whatever love and support yeah. as opposed to like the um the head mistress is like you know fascist like we're gonna practically starve them and like yeah uh, and they can't uh, complain about it and if they and, do then their parents should be ashamed of them and right and then but you know like the the head mistress walks in at that moment and it is this like confrontation of right. um and then kind of all the subsequent scenes are this kind of, you know, um, lesbianism becomes this, you know, parallel for uh, this, you know, anti-fascist This Yeah, this authoritarianism, yeah. Now, uh, in the cut that we saw um, 
on the, the Kino restoration. Um, is this completely uncentered? Are there still parts that are taken out and they're lost from the film or? No, this is, that. that is the, you know, to, as far as we know, yeah, okay. that is the final. And, um, um, and there, you know, there are, again, there are moments where like, I'm trying to think of the, you know, there are kind of code words of like, you know, I don't wanna say like, does she say like unnatural or? Yeah, there's the there's the scene when she's when it's just after she was drunk and she's in the you know in the infirmary or whatever and the headmistress right. comes in and she's she doesn't yeah like like you said she doesn't say it's explicitly but she's like something along the lines of like people like you yeah. um, mm -hmm. get, don't deserve to live in society yeah and it's, just, it's stuff like that where she's not but she's not being explicit but what else is she talking about right she's when she walks in the first thing she says is what a scandal you know yeah and like and it's like okay because yeah the what um manuela says is like everybody should know you know mm -hmm. and like it's you know all of it's like what she's talking about obviously is that she's in love yeah um, which that's such a fascinating scene too because i love how she focuses like on the different faces and these these girls like jesse you were talking about earlier who have been yeah. very like uh, you know, excited, uh, very open about like having a crush on this teacher. Yeah. Like you can tell that she's crossed the line in that moment. And it's, and there's almost something they don't necessarily like, you know, ditch her in any way, but the, it's almost like, you know, Oh, you broached something that we weren't supposed to broach. There is like this like transgression to it. Right. And that, but then as it develops, right. And then it's like, you gradually get this sense like and then especially when they're starting to worry about her and they're like where's Manuela where's Manuela yeah. mm -hmm. and like it's like oh my god they all like love her and care about yeah. her and they're like you know what's going on and um and you do have this sense of like that they are all you know on the side of you know lesbianism I know <laughs> I just love all they're all allies. <laughs> like they they said like consequences be damned this is our friend she's yeah. clearly in distress and, and we're gonna do whatever we can i thought that was so fabulous I love that. yeah and like you know that it works again like it isn't like you know that whatever a, a remake today would be like right. she's like full-on really a lesbian <laughs> like or like yeah. really a, you know characterized in a full way um so you know it's like it's all subdued but it's but it's happening and and but especially it's especially important knowing all of the history mm -hmm. and who was involved and you know the stuff of like Erica Mann and um her lover Teresa Geisy who actually who was a, a also a significant figure in le out lesbian in the um German theater at the time and who uh interestingly in the 1958 remake, which mm -hmm. is also really great with Rami Schneider and um, what's her name? Um, Teresa Geisy plays the headmistress. Oh, uh, yeah. And which is like kind of mind blowing because, you know, <laughs> she's like this out lesbian mm -hmm. playing this homophobic, you know, homophobic, whatever, authoritarian yeah. of the, the headmistress. Um, I wanted to I think oh, go ahead. Uh, just to say, I mean, this is a, a an important piece of the conversation to have is, and I, I talk about this in, in the commentary, that, um, you know, in the plot of the film, it's written that Manuela is 14, I think, 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you're kind of like, okay, she's in love with her teacher. And like, her teacher is, you know, whatever, her teacher. And, and you know, it's uncomfortable and like, mm -hmm. uh, as a viewer to be like, um, I don't know how I feel about this. Right. Um, this seems uh, problematic, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so a couple of things. One is that it was actually originally a, well, it was originally a novel and then it was a play. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the cast is from the play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the actresses, the actresses, other than the headmistress, are basically all the same age. Like they're in their twenties, I think is what I put. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you said uh, Manuela, the actress who plays Manuela and the actress who plays uh, Von uh, Bernberg were both 22, right? At the filming yeah. of the. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're the same age. And mm-hmm. so, and, and you kind of, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I could can see that in, you know, certain, well, in the very first scene, you have the sense of like, this actress is not 14, um, uh, you know. Um, anyway, but I think, you know, that helps a lot to be yeah. like, okay, these actors are actually the same age. Um, even if we're pretending that they're 14 and 22 or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think something that's just really beautiful about the film, and it's something you talk a little about in the commentary, um, is how it kind of does fluctuate between something that's overtly romantic versus um, something that could just be kind of like a childhood infatuation or something like that. A mother-daughter um, type thing almost. Yeah. Like a surrogate mother. And so I think like it's really open to interpretation as the viewer of, you know, is uh, Von Bernberg, is she maybe supposed to be read as a lesbian too, or is she just a very nurturing person who recognizes a little bit too late that this girl is actually in love with her and not just kind of doing a silly infatuation like some of the other school girls are. Um, and I think, you know, she tries her best to kind of shut it down and firmly and then realizes she wants to do it soft. She wants to go back to Manuela and, and try and, Recommunicate what she kind of communicated a little too sternly, but I, I kind of lost my train of thought here. I guess um, I think that the movie kind of navigates that relationship in not necessarily a yeah, this would be we do wish this played out kind of way, but more of like a yeah, maybe this probably wouldn't not because of the same sex romance but because of the age difference and the power dynamics right. this really doesn't need to play out and we don't necessarily need to be rooting for it but we do need to be like affirming of the feelings and, and um that experience as a young queer woman for manuela um yeah. i just think i think it plays that so well there I, it does and it really like i mean it it uses that in a dramatic way that and again, also like quite in these subtleties where mm-hmm. there's a scene where they're in the in the Frau von Bernberg's office together, and and Manuela is kind of con- confessing, and yeah. and you can see, and it's you know that kind of thing of like yeah. what the other character sees, but then what we see as an audience, and we see Frau von Bernberg, you know restraining herself and again it's like subtle but it's Mm -hmm. like she's like we're meant to know that she does have some feelings for her Mm -hmm. and that she's you know i mean i think the sense is like i'm a teacher she's a student i can't do that that would be not okay (laughs) and from a narrative standpoint if she did do that the audience would be like, uh, I don't like her anymore. <laughs> like, yeah. not okay. Um, yeah. And um, you know, but that, but that having that be this like, you know, dramatic tension um, is, you know, it's so perfect how it, how it, it gives us just this yeah. little bit of, of, you know, that insight into her right. character. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me also kind of going back a little bit to how this was received that um, a lot, you mentioned that a lot of the community, uh, the queer community in Berlin, uh, I forgot the freight, like this was like almost like child's, like, like, a, like a child's version of like yeah. a lesbian story. <laughs> versus they were, like Marlene Dietrich. <laughs> yeah, versus oh, the blue, Hollywood. the blue angel. I mean, like, what did, what did you, uh, what did you make of that when you were kind of learning about that? Well, that was that was also from the Hertha Thiele interview that she was saying, like, you know, yeah, the actual lesbians, you know, who were like out carousing at the bar <laughs> and like, you know, <laughs> were like, uh, whatever, this like <laughs> schoolgirl movie, uh, you know, yeah, whatever, you know, they're, and they're, yeah, they were more like, yeah, give us uh, Dietrich and the Blue Angel, she's hot. <laughs> like, um, or that was the kind of, you know, implied, yeah. implied sense of it of like, some, you know, a, a sophisticated story is what, what we want as a lesbian community, not this like schoolgirl romance. Which that's, that's, that's kind of interesting to me because, um, you know, 
I, I, I understand that, but you're, you know, at the same time you, you think of like, cause I mean, I, I watched actually the blue angel relatively recently and mm-hmm. she is, she's like very, um, she has such a presence in that movie and not just like in the, in like the club scene where she's like, you know, walking around in the tuxedo and it's incredible, but also just that whole, that whole movie in general, she just does have this presence. And it's just interesting to me that like, that's what they responded to is more just how she kind of presents herself on screen and that kind of how that works compared to a story that seems much more directly speaking to, to the community that, that, that you would think would respond to that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I imagine to some degree that Heritatile was uh, also overstating that a little bit. Sure. Um, I mean, I would imagine that they would have been pretty happy to be like, Oh, that's, you know, actual. Yeah. yeah love between women on screen kind of thing but yeah. but at the same time you know yeah. martina Mar- she, she's pretty great in the blue angel i can't fault them there if they're if they're gonna go with that the club scene is amazing yeah yeah uh, my watch list yeah no it's that just i mean just that scene in, in general is is great um i i'm curious so i i, I also read um B. Ruby Rich's the the 1981 review that she did, and she, you also mentioned that the the her Tatila, um interview happened in the in the 80s. Was was there kind of a revival and in interest of the movie like in the 80s? I guess what what kind of jumpstart that 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 writing and, and reexamining of it, and um, you know what yeah. kind of brought it back up into the consciousness? Yeah, I mean, my sense is that it was you know revived as a as a film by a woman director, um, as a mm-hmm. feminist film, um, and you know, just the the research, R- Ruby's research, and um, Carola and Heidi Schwartzman is the other woman who did the interview with Hertha Thiele, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, I just found the quote of the what the headmistress says to Manuela. Oh, okay. Which is the someone like you should be cursed. People like you are banned from society. And like, you know, pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. That. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, you know, there's not too, you don't have to do too much reading between the lines there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I guess kind of around that time, it's, I'm sure it started to kind of make its way into various, you know, LGBT film programming. And that's kind of what started to uh, I, not remind people of it, but probably a lot of people discover it for the first time since it really didn't get much of a, of a play in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, I'm sure around the 80s, that's when people started to discover it as this, as this kind of lost lesbian film from the silent or the almost silent era yeah it played at a lot of well it's the the gay film festivals that were around at that time it it played multiple times there were so few films at the time um um and um yeah and interestingly um so in i have done a lot of research on this film. Um, so there was a 1958 um, German remake, mm-hmm. um, but there was also a 1951 um, Mexican right. remake yeah. that was called Muchachas de Uniforme, mm-hmm. and which is is I originally thought like that seems odd, like <laughs> why Mexico, and it was. Yeah. Um, uh, Alfredo de Cravena, who was a German producer, I want to say. I'm like, it's been a while since I did all the, did the, the uh, audio commentary. I did had all this stuff down. Um, he was uh, the kind of originator of the Mexican remake, mm-hmm. and the Mexican remake is so good. Is and it, it? Okay. it's it's not available. Um, I spent decades trying to get access to it, and about I don't know, maybe seven years ago, 
worked with um, Outfest in LA and we were able to get a print. We actually had to do our own um, soft subtitling of it. Like mm -hmm. it was not an English subtitle print. Wow. And, um, and um, it's really amazing. And it, it sets it in a Catholic girls school. So it has this whole Catholic overlay. So the headmistress is a mother superior and mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of even more um, explicit in the lesbian aspect. Um, and I continue to, uh, you know, plug away, trying to like figure out a way to get a- Oh, I'd love to see a, it. A release of it in some way. I'll I think- Put that back on my to-do list. I think you mentioned, so that, cause it's, that was one of the other things I wanted to, to ask about is just like, Cause I thought it was interesting that, so the, in the play she commits suicide, mm -hmm. but then she does not in the movie. And then I think, did you say in the, in the Mexican remake, she commits suicide? Um, it's funny. I'm like, it's hard to keep track. And it really, I'm sorry if I'm. No, I'm no, you're, it, it, that, that's what was interesting is, is it's like, um, there's like very, it's like one, she commits suicide, right. then she does. And then, then the other one she does, um, I just I I, th I found it interesting that if mm -hmm. that that was the case that the play in the play that she committed suicide, but then in the film version, I wasn't sure if there was like they just decided against it. Okay. To me, it was just interesting as like a kind of a it was somewhat of a rebuke of the of the you know you know dead queer character kind of trope that you would see generally in movies. Um, yeah, I mean, since this was 1931 you know, there wasn't, that mm -hmm. trope didn't exist yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, or well, and actually, you know, we think more of that trope actually arising primarily out of the, um, the Hayes Code and that it was mm -hmm. a necessity due to, you know, Hollywood, um, mm -hmm. uh, that that's kind of how that came to be, you know, through the 40s and 50s and 60s and, yeah. you know, um, uh, so it's not necessarily yeah, related yeah. to that, but but uh, there is something I I some of the research where somebody involved in the production was like uh, basically it would be too melodramatic to have her commit suicide, and so let's not have her do that. So glad but, they made that choice. <laughs> I'm glad they did too. <laughs> Less out of any you know lesbian politics and more out of some sense of dramaturgy that it was mm. gonna be too schlocky <laughs> um, yeah so thank we can you know thank them for that um yeah yeah what do you do you, do you so i guess you you enjoy, you like the uh the way that the the movie ends just kind of in that that shot with the with the headmistress kind of walking away and it fades into the end card i love it that the you know, the conclusion, the sense that you have is, um, you know, her classmates have come to her rescue mm -hmm. and Frau von Bernberg have come to her rescue. Um, and that, um, you know, the headmistress it, it actually, I think, you know, sees the, the error of her ways, like sees yeah. like, oh my God, you know, the, what I have wrought is like this, you know, student just almost killed themselves mm -hmm. and and uh i mean so you actually have this like glimmer of sympathy for her that 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 she sees what has been mm -hmm. yeah, the result of her intolerance yeah. and and that you know she kind of slinks off and that you have this sense of her as being defeated mm -hmm. oh and of you know authoritarianism and fascism being defeated which of course was you know uh wishful thinking i mean you know it's so intense that this was made yeah. in 1931 and you know like a minute later you know like a little more than a year later yeah. hitler rises to power and um uh you know and then a lot of folks have to Flee. And I mean, there are a lot of them, the folks involved in the production were Jewish. Um, some of them were queer. Um, and then there's like really interesting stuff. Like one of the cinematographers goes on to shoot Triumph of the Will. Um, 
uh, what was it one of the 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 producer the guy who or what's his oh shoot carl carl frolick who who is a very prominent you know nazi figure is it you know like to me that's just the irony of like this very prominent nazi figure working in this lesbian drama <laughs> it's just it's just kind of you know there's a lot there yeah um yeah but you know so it does have this um quality though of really or shadowing, you know, what's about to happen. And um, it's quite chilling in that respect, you know, to, to like watch it in that framework. Um, that seems so great too, because like it cut, there's just no sound, it's quiet, it's silent, and they like go and help her, and then it just goes silent, and you just have the headmistress kind of walking. It is very ominous and, mm -hmm. and yeah. spooky she recedes into the into the yeah. darkness. And um, I have to say, I mean, I recorded the audio commentary last year in some moment where it felt very, um, you know, the sense of what was going on in the world, sure. particularly in relation to our former president. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just this sense of, of uh, how bad things can be yeah. Um, yeah. and how we, you know, what we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and I mean, actually, it's kind of weird to think of obviously having not knowing that January 6th was going to happen. Um, yeah. But um, anyway, but, but, and I, you know, it's a really, it's just such a powerful film mm. for our time yeah um as well for that reason politically no it's 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 inter i was i was thinking a little bit about that because you know it's it's good that you don't have you know even though it's a little bit prior to the trope one you don't have like her dying because that would mm -hmm. just kind of you know in, enter into that that realm but also you know and it's not necessarily the movie's job to do this but there is i kind of felt the same way while watching her kind of recede into the darkness it's like oh the you know the fascism is going into the darkness and you're like i mean no it's not i mean it's <laughs> it's it's bright and shiny and all over the place still and so like there's something like it's almost a little like cold comfort like it's good to see that and i like the ending of the movie but it's also mm -hmm. cold comfort because i'm just like yeah but you you almost needed to push the fascism off the stairs because then it's gonna come <laughs> back <laughs> right yeah. At, so. it's true. And I, I mean, I think what I, you know, I guess maybe I'm just an eternal optimist or, you know, what I, you know, took away from it was, you know, it, particularly that these were cultural people who were like, what can we do to fight? What can we do? Um, and they fought, they were fighting, you know, and, and then, you know, um, particularly like Erica Mann and Teresa Geisy, leave and they go off to actually they come to the US and they're fighting the fight here, you know, mm -hmm. as things are getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and that people keep fighting. And I mean, not to get, you know, schlocky, <laughs> but that is what we need to do, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't give up and that we, and, and you know, that as a filmmaker, as a cultural worker, like, we can tell stories that galvanize people and and help people see what is right and that we want to come to the aid of our uh, classmates and our Thank country <laughs> and um yeah fight the fight yeah yeah, yeah. i feel like the I just think that it, to me, it has such a hopeful ending. Um, it made me think a lot about um, the ties that bind a book by Sarah Shulman um, about familial, hom familial homophobia and just the idea of shunning the way when she has her like drunken confession that night, um, they're all kind of forcing all the students to shun her and keep her away. And um, treating queer people like that is murder. I mean, it, it's it's just agreeing tacitly or overtly to hurt and harm. And um, a big part of the book is just completely rejecting 
um, homophobia and rejecting um, it anywhere we see it. And I think sometimes it's hard, especially, um, you know, if you're somebody who is straight passing, um, sometimes it can be kind of challenging to stand up when you hear something like that. Um, but when we stand, when we refuse to, or when we, when we stay quiet and let homophobia be pervasive, then we're allowing this to continue. And I guess what I found so hopeful of the movie is how just all of these people come together and show her love and show her that she needs to stay alive. And, and, and they really just push out this headmistress. Um, I just found that really powerful, even if it's not necessarily realistic always, but I found it really hopeful to me. Um, I love how you just said all that. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I feel the same way. I really, uh, it's a beautiful, a beautiful story um, in, in that way. Yeah. Well, we we very much uh, enjoyed having you here to talk a little bit about it because, uh, you know, it is good to kind of, I hope that um, that people, that my, my, my fear, especially, you know, when we do this series, my fear is always um, that people will kind of get shied away from the, because it's black and white. Luckily this one like has sound, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, I hope that people who, especially people who are interested in kind of exploring, uh, you know lgbt cinema like like mm -hmm. are in, interested in that we'll kind of seek this out to show that um you know pre like 1950 that there's movies that were engaging in this uh in a way that was kind of unique and really insightful um i hope so too i mean i think it just the last thing to say is also that it's like cinematically very interesting both mm -hmm. the the way it's shot there's a bunch of great stuff in the way it's shot and in the sound the use of sound is quite sophisticated for its time i mean mm. very early sound. um and um and the the performances are fantastic and like mm -hmm. the particularly this sense of ensemble and mm -hmm. like um you know some of the characters are just amazing like so colorful and mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. has like humor and um anyway and it's just really entertaining and mm -hmm. yeah no it's, i've watched it twice in the last week and it's like it's I, it was great both times <laughs> yes yes agreed uh, uh, well yeah. yeah so it's on the criterion channel right now yes. with my audio commentary too which is nice mm -hmm. um and also on blu-ray from kino lorber the bfi also you it did the did a blu-ray um with my audio commentary which was nice, nice. um and um Anyway, I'm sure it's various other places as well. But it um, is. yeah, but but seek those out because um yeah those are pretty mm -hmm. those were pretty because I think on Kino for those who who maybe don't have Criterion Channel I think you can watch it through Kino's website like they have oh that's right have it there so yes yeah. yeah awesome um cool well thank you for having me I always so enjoyed talking with you yeah it was great thank you so much I, I'm gonna go ahead and do I think we hit everything.